Hello Crazy House Chess fans, it's GM Max here, and today I'll be sharing with you a really cool game played by Jasugi99, the current world champion of Crazy House for 2020, playing against Aura Luster, which is an alternate account of Heisenberg Iran. As you can see, he's rated over 2700, one of the top six players in Crazy House Chess. And this game, we see how Jasugi managed to completely destroy Black Spirit's defense, which is something that's often played by players who just want to avoid Fury and try to get a game. But I find that top players like to play this move e5 and pressure the knight. A key point being that if black does move the knight away, well after h6 either black has to sack the knight and not really get enough compensation, or he retreats to h6 and his position is very passive. Uh, so in this game black actually played castles and decided to sacrifice the knight, which might seem like a bit of a weird idea, but the point of it is that if black were to play ef6, well he does manage to build a relatively safe protection around his king, Though I do think that compared to, say, the Alicant peace sack line with 1 knight 6 e5, that it's not as good a version with a bishop on g7. There are a lot of good moves, White. I mean, developing normally is certainly fine. But if you want to really try and punish their move order, the approach that really scores well for White is a move of knight to h6 here. And I do have knight 6 if black would have tried to just leave the knight there. White can go bishop to c4, kind of prompting black to drop a pawn on e6, which does block the e-file. And we could either just castle and just have a position with the extra port and the initiative. Or to go for the kill, you could play h4 and h5. Which actually is something that Jasugi himself played with white last year in a game which we was winning, but didn't end up winning it in the end. So that kind of explains why with this attack being so strong, why you typically see black take instead. But this is a position where white is very, very comfortable. And we kind of see that even though black is able to safeguard his king with knight f5, that ultimately black just doesn't really have... An attacking sub. Like in a position like this he only really has possibilities to defend. Whereas white can castle, put a bishop on c4, even put a bishop on g4 for that matter. And he's going to try to pressure black on the light squares and black doesn't really have the drops to be able to kind of cover himself fully and also try to pressure uh, white as compensation for the lost piece. So instead black played him at bishop f6 but I think that this is a weaker move and Jasugi manages to punish it very convincingly. Playing the move knight at h6, and this is also the reason, by the way, why you'll often see black play the move pawn to h6 in these pink carry lines to avoid this knight h6 kind of idea. After king h8, Jasugi went ahead with h4. While I think that actually this might not have been the most precise move order, I think you want to go bishop c4 first, because you do get benefit from provoking e6 and you know, leaving black a bit weaker on those dark squares. Uh, but h4 is also perfectly good and definitely... In the right spirit of the position to use that pawn as a hook and bring our rook into the attack. Black now played the move knight to c6, which I don't really like to be honest. I think that pawn at g7, well at least in this way it allows you to get the piece back. Although the position would still be very bad for black, even after something like h5 for example. Well we kind of see that after g takes h5 actually, the players actually had another game. Uh, actually I can see why my own game is funnily enough against this aura luster player, where after rook h5. Well, we kind of see that even if black does take the knight, still the black king is very exposed. You know, a pawn could drop on g5 and f6. And black is just way too weak on the dark squares, and white should win pretty comfortably from here. Actually, yeah, I mean, this is pretty simple enough, I think. So after knight c6, well, in the game, white just went h5, very consistent, and just going for the attack. Of course, knight g5 and bishop g c4. Otherwise, to try to exploit the weakness on f7 is kind of a... Well, very common theme in Crazy House, because this pawn is, after all, only defended by the king in the beginning of the game. The game continued, g takes h5. I mean, allowing h6 would be even worse. At least this way, black sort of gets a tempo for pawn at g6. But this way, it kind of becomes clear that the position is very bad for black. I mean, I think the best practical try might be to play a move like h3, and actually give up the pawn just to make sure the rook doesn't get in the attack. But still, of course, if you're playing such moves and you're a piece down, it's not really... A sign that you're going to survive. Instead black played pawn at g7 trying to get rid of the knight once again but also black has some tactical problems as well and the move pawn at g5 is a great way to get rid of the bishop on f6 that's really the main defender of black's king. The game continued with bishop takes g d4 because if you go g8 6 actually it might even be better to play g takes h6 because once you get the pawn on g7 well kind of black has an unpleasant choice where either he gives up the bishop and the rook gets back in the attack. Or he leaves it there and all white needs in is a rook on h8 or a queen on h8 for mate. And okay, it'll take some time, but it means that black can't really open the position. 
And so, I mean, a position like this is basically strategically lost. Sooner or later, we're going to get the opening we need to be able to take the rook and win the game, or to win material in the process. So, black played bishop d7, 4, and you know, it's kind of a desperation at this point, where after takes, takes an e5. You know, white just played very much, let's say, in a way that reminds you like a Nakamura smear in game I once saw. We're going to move queen h4, which is just threatening knight f7 and queen h7 mate. After knight at h5, white just kept going in with bishop f6, and we sort of see the dynamic power in Crazy House, where he's able to keep dropping pieces for each time they try to defend. And also we see that in the period that black doesn't have that dark square bishop, his dark square is just way too weak. The game ended with queen f6, queen takes, king knight takes. And if you want to challenge yourself, see if you can find the mate in 4 that white has in this position. If you want to try and solve it, this is a good chance to pause the video and try to improve your Crazy House skill. Okay, so Josugi finished the game basically by following everything with a check. So pawn at g7. Also, when you keep doing this with a check, you don't give black time to drop his pieces on the board. So knight f5 check. And that clears the way for the bishop to come to h6 and the queen to come to g7. Uh, so black in the game went takes. Bishop h6. And after king g6, then queen g5, mate. And uh, that was the end of the game. So as you can see, a very brutal game. And you know, it's also fun to kind of see these short games. Because they show us very clearly what White is aiming for when playing against the Pirates defense. Then we go e5. We open up the h file for our rook one way or another. And then it's kind of like Bobby Fischer's sack sack mate. As he said about the dragon. It kind of applies pretty well in Crazy House here. So that being said, well, uh, if you enjoyed this video or if you learned something new from this video, then do make sure to leave a like. And also consider subscribing, especially if you're new to the channel. It'll help you to keep updated with more of my Grandmaster Chess content. In any case, good luck in your next games, and I will see you in the next chess video, Crazy House Chess Fans.